Hi, I'm Stephanie. And I'm Daniel. We are the host of the EVLC podcast. Where we interview people that are making a positive impact in the world. Welcome back to the EVLC podcast. Today, we are interviewing Michael Bream. He is the founder of the, and CEO of EV West, and he is also on the board of directors of EVLC. Thank you for being here, Michael. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So firstly, can you tell us how you got involved with EVLC? Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's a loaded question because I think I got involved with EVLC through EV West, which is an electric vehicle car company that we run. So the impetus probably goes all the way back to that. And um, for me, the experience aligns with what EVLC brings to people. So in my personal situation, it was uh, doing projects and hobbies with my father, right? Uh, my dad was into cars. And so as I grew up and became, you know, driving age, I became very interested in automobiles. And later on, it became a hobby of mine and some friends. We were doing some kind of amateur racing and that just um, motivated me to kind of keep pushing it. And so, you know, this is back in uh, the mid 2000s and I start reading articles about Tesla and decided, you know, maybe we should try and build an electric car. And this is before Tesla even shipped a single car, right? So we still didn't have uh, a model you know, or a blueprint to go off of. It was just something that we kind of wanted to do. Um, so we, I set out to build a, a, a race car for the um, Pikes Peak International Hill Climb, a second oldest race in America that's out in Colorado. And uh, we were successful. We ran a really good race and set a record. And it was that point that I decided this should become a company. And I should mention that when I went out to Pikes Peak and race, my dad came with me and he was like my pit crew. And it was really cool. You know, we had all this bonding. And so now you kind of fast forward ahead and you have fathers that, you know, like now I'm a father and I'm in that position where I want to work with my kid. But most of the guys and the peers my age were raised on gasoline, where my son is more interested in the electric motorcycle and the electric bicycle and the electric uh, toy car and all that stuff. So what we were seeing, we had some customers um, within the, the group of customers that we have at the electric vehicle shop that mimicked these same feelings. Like, um, you know, we get a lot of feedback from fathers and their son or daughter might have an electric toy and maybe it's not, maybe it broke or it's not running well. They don't really know how to diagnose it. And there was kind of a disconnect and, um, you know, so this is really a culmination of those ideas to take a traditional STEM uh, education training, but apply it to something that's more real, you know, like actual. So instead of teaching theories about a lot of this stuff, um, we've tried to be, you know, really hands on. Um, we've had some kids in, done some clinics and just, you know, trying to get them to, um, you know, actually build things, maybe replace battery packs and scooters and, um, you know, create a new generation that's going to have this hobby that they can go forward and, and then, you know, kind of bond and educate with their children, you know, over uh, basically electric vehicles. And that's going to set them up better for the future. It's going to give them a background um, in a field that is highly desirable for hiring. And it's also going to um, you know, it should really excite them about engineering as well, like engineering fields and degrees. So, okay. yeah. So, you know, in short, I'm sorry, that was a really long no, answer. Don't but, worry you about know, it. Uh, we, you know, I, I got into the electric vehicles, which has just been one of the um, most rewarding, most fun things I've ever done in my life. And after being involved in that, you know, it turns out there's this whole other element of taking that knowledge that we've learned and like kind of uh, figuring a way out to, to pass it on to the next generation. Okay. Sounds good. So can you tell us what you like most about EVLC? Um, you know, just, I think working uh, the, the single most rewarding thing is seeing what we teach come back to us. Like when we did in class training and you're talking to students and you query them, you do like an oral quiz 
uh, and then they're telling you things, you know, that they learned with enthusiasm and uh, good understanding. And that by far is the single most rewarding thing. Um, but, you know, it's fun. You know, we've mm-hmm. got electric dirt bikes and electric cars and big electric cars, small electric cars, fast electric cars. Um, and, and so, you know, it's a very enthusiastic place to be. So I think the combination between the enthusiasm for the fun and then the gratification of actually, you know, getting that confirmation that somebody really learned something that's going to be positive to them moving forward, you know. Okay. So for anyone who doesn't know, like, what is EV West? Yeah, so we are an electric vehicle shop that concentrates on older classic and vintage cars. So these are the cars that tend to pollute the most and then also are the ones that are more endearing to the owners. So in other words, the the cars that the owners don't ever want to part with because they've had them a very long time or they're sentimental because they've been in the family. Um, But at the same time, these are the cars that really do the most kind of polluting and all that. So we kind of do the... Uh, chocolate and peanut butter moment where you take these new, you know, modern drivetrains, emission-free drivetrains from vehicles like Tesla, et cetera, and put them in, you know, classic Chevy and Ford pickup trucks and old Volkswagen buses and things like that, that people really love and they want to continue driving. But, you know, in these modern times, the old drivetrains just aren't capable. Okay, so why did you start EV West? Um, Because we wanted to build a race car. And when we were trying to buy parts for it, nobody sold performance electric vehicle parts. Everybody was really focused on the environment. And while we are environmental, we are here to save the cars because the best thing about what we do is the side effect is saving the planet. So in other words, we try to get our customer base excited through the electrification of classic vintage and sports cars, which is really fun. And those, that demographic is gonna see it as very fun and be more enthused to kind of get on the program and convert their car rather than the other approach, which is kind of like the factory automaker approach, you know, where, you know, Toyota's like, hey, buy the Prius because it gets such good gas mileage and it doesn't pollute. And that's true and that's very effective, But um, as we transition, we have to understand that there's certain parts of the population that are going to be more hesitant because uh, they grew up around, you know, automotive mechanics and things like that. And they have a slightly different view. You know, some people will look at a car just as transportation and other people really look at it as like a part of them and it kind of represents them. And and those are the type of customers that we really speak to. Okay. So if you had to choose one or the other, EVLC or EV West, I think you know what I'm going to ask. It's kind of a hard question. Uh, it's an incredibly hard question. I've thought about this and I think, you know, it's a transition. I think right now I've got a lot of work to do at EV West because we're so new in it. But I also get such a reward out of EVLC that I see myself spending more time there in the future and actually trying to take on more of a role of a mentor or educator over there because, you know, we've been in a position to learn so much about these vehicles over here that we really want to then put ourselves in a position to share that knowledge. Okay. Okay. So what was your first job and what lessons did you learn from it? Um, so, you know, my first job, I worked in a, it was boring. I worked in a print shop, you know, we printed posters and it was really boring. Um, but I was really young at the time. And uh, the neat thing was, is, is you know, my father was really, he, he knew that I was super into cars. And one day he told me that there was a, an automotive electronics shop that had placed a help wanted ad. And it's so cool, right? Because it totally changed my life. I, I went and applied, I ended up getting the job. And so when I was 16 years old, I was working in automotive or mobile electronics as it was called. Um, and it was fascinating. I was able to work through college. I became good within the field. So I had employers that were willing to work around my college schedule. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, after graduating, I kind of went into a different field for a while, for about 20 years. So for me, this is kind of like a return 
home to my real original love and being around cars. I mean, it really is a, a dream come true and, and being able to expand that with EVLC, you know, to share it with more people is, is just amazing. So what has been like your favorite job that you've had so far? So, you know, I mean, I'd have to say this one, right? But yeah. everything was important. Like I mentioned, my early job at uh, the electronics company, you know, that was a, a changing, you know, a, a, a turning point for me in life and what I wanted to do. And, you know, the it was a little bit different than, you know, nobody ever even heard the word STEM. So there wasn't this emphasis on an education that kind of, um, you know, idolized or really, you know, championed or celebrated engineering. No, nobody was really celebrating engineering at the time. Um, and I went on to go to University of California, San Diego, and, you know, got my engineering degree there and was just like, this is so much fun, you know, like nobody told me how much fun it was going to be. We, you know, my first venture with an electric vehicle was for a senior project. We built an autonomous electric boat and it went out and did data sampling in the ocean, temperature, salinity, currents, things like that. And, you know, I had no idea that they were going to let me, you know, work on a team of engineers building a boat when I signed up for college. And I think if, you know, I think what STEM does is it kind of shows, uh, a lot of these jobs and that potential, you know, that somebody might not think that they have the skill set or the ability, or it might just be an absolute dream to maybe work on a, a race team or something like that. And so I think through using STEM and really popularizing and celebrating engineering, uh, if more kids go into the, that field, you know, they're going to have the same result that I had where on the tail end, they're like, oh my God, this is amazing. I love being an engineer. And there's so many things that I can design and build and do and really have an impact, uh, you know, on, on humanity for the, for the most part going forward. So, um, you know, I always tell, you know, when I talk to kids, like, hey, if you want to have fun, uh, when you get out of college, be an engineer. <laughs> it's no fun while you're in college. Yeah, I was gonna ask. Like, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's tough, right? Yeah. But you, the victor goes the, the spoils, you know, I so. heard. Yeah, I heard STEM majors have it hard during college, like it's a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of math, especially so it is, you know, I'm not gonna lie. But at the same time, it's not. Um, and, you know, it's not a, an ordinate amount. It's not unsurmountable. I mean, there's a ton mm -hmm. of engineers out there. And, and of course, the other thing is, is anytime it's human nature, anytime we do something tough and we come out successful, we try to make it sound tougher for everyone else going yeah. in and ourselves feel better. But the reality is, is that, you know, compared to a lot of other degrees out there, um, it, it's, it's not extremely tough. But I think the most important thing to understand is we're in a time period now where, there's a greater and greater importance put on engineering degrees. So you might say it's really tough to go into engineering, but actually what I think is really tough is going into a field that might be uh, on the edge of obsolescence, obsolescence, or, you know, maybe it's just not in demand or you're going to struggle getting a job or trying to pay back student loans or whatever. Whereas, you know, you go into engineering and you're going to be in a high demand field for the rest of your career. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about your previous skateboard company? Yeah, so I owned and operated Gravity Skateboards for 23 years. It was absolutely, it was a ton of fun. Uh, I am an engineer, so, you know, I was involved in the design and engineering. We did things like uh, aluminum casting for the trucks, and we used CNC machines to cut the shapes of the boards and the, the um, curvature and the concave and all that. Um, so it was fun because we got to use, you know, I got into skateboarding at a time when a lot of technology came in, you know, old school manufacturing was a lot of handwork. And when we got into it, we utilized, you know, CNC. So we basically had computer controlled uh, cutting machines to make the boards and things like that. So it was a lot of fun. And I, I think most importantly, um, for me anyways, because I was an engineer, I never really had business experience. So it was a really fun way to get some business experience that I could take with me. Um, but not like in a school setting in a more fun, you know, it was a skateboard company. So it was, it was a real fun setting. And at the same time, it's also zero emission transportation. So I'm kind of yeah. staying within the field. So it's been a lot of fun. It was a great, um, 
job to get me where I'm at and, and meet a lot of people. And uh, um, I think it was very instrumental in, in getting me involved in what I'm doing now. Okay, so I was going to ask, like, in relation to, like, EVLC, EV West, and the skateboarding company, like, was there ever a moment where you felt like you failed, like you were about to give up? Was there any, like, a single moment that you remember? Okay, so first of all, you guys are asking really good questions. I mean, like, I just got off an interview with a major <laughs> newspaper, and you're asking better questions than they did. Daniel, yes, there was. We started in 2009, and uh, it just was not popular. And uh, we had this dream. We were trying to be altruistic. You know, we knew Tesla was trying to build a car at the time, but they still hadn't actually built a car. Um, and, and this is really what we wanted to do. And, you know, we built our first race car, had success at Pikes Peak. We set a record, and we went on to build a couple more competition cars. But at this point, these were kind of, um, you know, they were singular projects. We still didn't have like mass acceptance. The phone wasn't really ringing. People weren't calling us up saying the best thing I can do is convert my Volkswagen bus. So we went through a period where, you know, we questioned, is, is this going to survive? Is this something that we should even be doing, you know, as a um, father and a, and a husband, you know, I was wondering did I make the wrong decision? Because, you know, for quite a while, there hasn't been this mass acceptance of electric vehicles and electric vehicle technology. And so I really have to thank Tesla, because I think they brought that to the masses where, you know, for the listeners out there, I think most people, their first experience with an electric car is probably getting in a Tesla or a Volt or a Leaf. Um, and then realizing like, oh, my God, these things are amazing. This is a terrific terrific experience and you know recently so I think then around 2017 2018 they really started to gain a lot of momentum it started to be in the news a lot and people started to actually have an interest in electric vehicles so they were calling the shop like hey I want to buy some parts and convert my car and so that helped us out but in the middle there there was this period you know 2014 2015 um, where it was really, really difficult because we didn't think that the company was going to survive, you know, and so we wouldn't be here to kind of share the joy and the knowledge and the experience with people. And that was kind of heartbreaking. And um, we just, you know, are so thankful that the, the country and, you know, kind of turned on to electric cars and saw the huge benefit. Um, you know, we have solar here at the shop we charge our cars out back and uh, i have solar at the house and it really makes you feel good knowing that you know all your energy is kind of coming from a closed loop and and uh, you can kind of provide for yourself and you can't do that with fossil fuels you can't do that with gas you can't you know nobody's going to open a gas refinery or an oil refinery yeah. in their house you know but at the same time you know putting up solar panels or doing a little power wall project in the backyard um, and you can charge your car off of that and then start driving. And now it's so relevant with five, six and $7 a gallon gas. Now it's just going crazy. And there's a lot of relevancy there. Yeah. I could only imagine how scary it is when like the whole world isn't accustomed to seeing like electric vehicles. It's all gas at this point, like a while ago. Right. And just like introducing electric vehicles or starting an electric vehicle company, how daunting it could be, you know? So yeah, you know, when you put it in those terms, and, I, and we look back on it, uh, yeah, it's, it was crazy. And uh, if we didn't have EV West today, I don't know if I would have uh, the time or the energy to, to start something like this. It really did uh, take a lot, especially because we started in a time where EVs did not have mass acceptance like they do now. You know, there was still a lot of people that were skeptical about them. Yeah. Okay. So can you tell us something interesting about yourself most people don't know? Oh, gosh. No, <laughs> I, I don't have any secrets. I'm sorry. I, I, uh, I think I've done enough interviews that I've told enough about me. Um, you know, I think some people think because I'm involved in electric cars, I'm kind of um, 
an environmentalist. And again, I'm more of a technology nerd and I love technology. I think it, it uh, keeps my brain active and it keeps me engaged and enthused. And um, so, you know, I think uh, if I was going to try and tell a secret, I still absolutely love the sound of gas cars. And I hope I, that never goes away. But at the same time, I want to see, you know, everything electrified because for me, the electrification is more the bigger picture of a sustainable energy economy, right? So right now we're burning up limited resources and we're not replenishing them and by switching to electricity and electric drive and evs that will then become a sustainable resource um, and so that's that's the most important thing but at the same time you know there's a part of me the secret part of me that really loves history i mean that's the reason we got into this because we're taking you know old cars with doors that are rusty and full of patina like that behind me and we're kind of giving them a new lease on life and um and so that's exciting but to come from that background we still have a lot of love for the heritage and um you know what everybody knows is you know automotive you know okay do you have any like interesting hobbies maybe people don't know about anything <laughs> No, you know, I, um, I like to, you know, play with electric bikes. My son and I do a lot of um, electric bike riding and we're very involved in um, working on the bikes and upgrading them and maintaining them and building new battery packs uh, to go further and to go faster. So that's, that's a lot of fun. And then that transfers over into some other neat hobbies where we play with, uh, um, you know, some remote control cars and planes and things like that, because it's still revolving around that electric drivetrain and electric controls and stuff like that. So, you know, those are the things I like to do, you know, occasionally when the weather's just right, surf and do a few other things. But, okay. uh, but for the most part, I, I'm a car guy. And, and what's yeah. great is I'll work all week and then on the weekend go to a car show. <laughs> <laughs> you still, you still are involved with cars, even on the weekends. Yeah, it's fun. You know, I yeah. think, you know, if you grow up and, you know, you're really into nature, you're probably never going to outgrow that. Or if you grow up and you're a city person, you're probably never going to outgrow that. So for me, you know, again, my earliest experiences that were really neat and positive and rewarding was working on vehicles, you know, working on cars with my dad. Because, you know, on one hand, yeah, you might be learning everything you need to know about a 2.3 liter inline four or whatever. But on the other hand, you're learning other little knowledge and tips that are going to carry with you for a long time, especially just even like eye hand coordination and dexterity, working with tools, power tools, you know, things that take control. Um, and, and so all of those skills come from that, right? It doesn't really matter if you're working on a car, a motorcycle, whether it's electric drive or gas drive. I think if you approach those projects and have like an, um, an, op an openness and a willingness to learn new things, uh, those experiences are going to be incredibly rewarding. Okay. I was going to ask, how do you think, like, what is your impact in the world? How are you making the world a better place? Um, by maybe making it more fun. You know, I think that, again, um, we're trying to clean up the earth, right? And it doesn't have to be all work. We can make some of the elements of the process fun. And I think that's ultimately what we're trying to do. Instead of making people feel guilty about cleaning up their act, um, why not have fun doing it and celebrate it and turn it into a new project and something fun that they can do where they learn skills they can pass skills on they can inspire other people to do similar projects um and and so if we have any impact um i would say it's really our customers you know out there our army of uh ev conversion enthusiasts that are really the ones doing the hard work we're just here uh, helping them along Okay, so this is the last question. What would you be doing if you weren't involved with like vehicles, the electric vehicles or what you're doing right now? 
That's a very tough question. Um, but I would probably be sitting somewhere at a job, at a desk, doing something that I didn't like, uh, probably on the internet, uh, probably Googling cars and wishing I was working on cars <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> so yeah, it would, I would be somewhere else, but wishing that this is what I was doing. You know, again, um, this did not come easy for uh, myself, my family, or the early employees in the shop. It was very difficult to do this back in the day. There wasn't a lot of money. There wasn't a lot of recognition. We were just kind of in our shop and nobody was visiting us. Nobody was calling us. In hindsight, it sounds like it was a brilliant decision, but we can't really take credit for that because again, at the time, uh, none of this really had the appeal that it has now. So we were just doing it really for ourselves. It was something that we thought uh, was important and fun and, you know, might lead to something. But uh, nowadays, I think it's easy to look at the industry and say, well, it'd be a smart choice to go into that because there's a lot of demand. And I hope that's what people see, right? That's a very good way to go into something is look at a field, see if there's a lot of demand there. And if it's something that you enjoy, say like automotive, um, you know, to me, that's a perfect blend of getting an engineering degree and having everything that you need to do it, but also setting yourself up, positioning yourself for those jobs and those careers that are going to continue to be in high demand. And of course, they're, they're all going to be technical. They're going to be, you know, engineering, coders, people that can code, people that can design hardware. Um, those are, you know, all the positions that people are looking for. And even right now, as I'm speaking, you know, we have this like supply chain crisis and they literally need more engineers, more people to set up more chip factories and make more chips and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and, and to me, you know, uh, that's a lot of fun, <laughs> you know, so trying to, you know, encourage people to go into it because, um, we really believe that that is best preparing themselves for, you know, a bright future, a fun future, and, and one that's um, going to keep their skill set in demand, which feels really good. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for taking the time to talk to us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having thank me. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks. And, you know, really love being a part of EVLC and um, just can't wait to keep on working on the next project and encouraging students to uh, follow us. <laughs>